He was a super racist Australian who helped spur the revival of British folk music. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Percy Granger. Percy Granger was born in Melbourne, in Australia, in 1882, and was to be the only child of John and Rose Granger. John was an architect with a proclivity for binge drinking, and would often leave Rose for days at a time, only to come back after having slept in the gutter. Literally. He was emotionally abusive towards his wife and young son, but actually refrained from beating Percy. That was Rose's job. Rose used corporal punishment on Percy until he was 16 years old, which likely left deep psychological scars, which we will see later. Rose, who came from the bigoted Aldridge family, was an atheist who nonetheless turned statues of Greek gods toward her stomach while she was pregnant in the hopes that they would bestow some measure of artistic talent upon the yet unborn Percy. Rose was controlling of Percy to such an extreme degree that she would actually control who he had relationships with and how close they were. And this was incredibly unhealthy. This bizarre closeness lasted until Rose's death. On top of the topsy-turvy home life, Percy was never able to go outside and play with other kids. In fact, he only had three months of actual formal schooling. And throughout his life, he continued to show signs that he missed his childhood and wanted to have a childhood that he was never allowed to have. Percy managed to inherit his mother's ideas on race, which were near Nazi-like in their Aryan supremacy, blonde hair, blue eye is the best sort of thing. In fact, the Aldridge family were incensed at the notion of their daughter marrying a man who had brown hair. Once Percy's youthful blondness began darkening, Rose would bleach it with peroxide. Percy would go on to view the Battle of Hastings as the uttermost cultural tragedy of modern history. He viewed the Nordic races as the most perfect racial specimens in all of planet Earth, and in fact went so far as to invent something he called blue-eyed English, which was English with all the Latin and Greek words taken out. Audiences became concert listeners, crescendo became loud and hugely, and the viola became the middle fiddle. The music that Percy was to write would be filled with all of these uber-English words, which makes his music very distinctive on paper. John Granger eventually left for England in the hopes of curing his alcoholism, and he and his wife were never to live together again. In England, he was shunned by his family for his addictions and his infidelity, and Rose was actually informed that she had contracted a form of syphilis because of John's infidelity. She feared that Percy also had it, but that ended up being a false alarm as she had contracted it after he was born. The two were very poor, and Rose began teaching students in piano, all while homeschooling her son in the liberal arts. She introduced him to Nordic legends that kept him fascinated for years, and eventually realized that he was becoming so good at the piano that she was just holding him back. He began composing at the age of 11, and by 12 made a splash on the concert scene in a recital organized by his teacher, Louis Pabst. Pabst would soon return to his native Europe, and Percy soon outgrew Australia's music environment. In 1895, Rose and Percy set sail for Europe and ended up in Frankfurt, Germany, where Rose taught English while Percy studied at the Hawk Conservatory, whose piano program had been brought to new heights by the recently retired Clara Schumann. While Percy excelled in his piano studies, he had his differences with his composition professor and ended up quitting that in order to study privately with a folk song collector. His name was Carl Klimsch, and Percy was to later say that he was his only true composition professor, and his ideas on folk music were to influence Percy in his later work. Percy's incredible racism meant that he was not even about to write something he would call a sonata, or a symphony, or a concerto. He just thought these were bad news because they were inherently Germanic. He fell in with three other students, all of them English, who bonded over the fact that they spoke a common language in an unfamiliar land. And while three have faded into relative obscurity, his classmate Cyril Scott went on to considerable fame himself. They lacked the cohesiveness necessary to turn themselves into something resembling Les Six or The Mighty Handful, and they often as not denigrated others' works as often as they praised them. They are occasionally referred to as the Frankfurt Five. Around this time, Granger and his mother moved to England. World War I was still a few years away, but Granger was very, very frustrated at the pre-war musical outlook. He was not a fan of the hobnobbery and richness and the upper crust which he felt forced to play for. 
He became known as an England Society pianist, and he didn't necessarily like that. Percy would later look back on the pre-war years with utter disdain because he felt like the government wasn't doing nearly enough for the common man. Rose really enjoyed the fact that he was with the upper crust, but Percy enjoyed the common folk as much or even more so than playing for the upper class. Whenever he spent a few nights away from his mother with people she considered to be of lower social stock than himself, she would be very angry with him for multiple days. He would give lessons at their house, and if they went so much as a minute over, Rose would come in and pace behind them until the awkwardness just got so much that the student had to leave. Visitors calling on Percy could only do so during very short times of the day, as Rose was incredibly controlling of this as well as pretty much everything else. Percy thought nothing of this. In fact, he thought that his mother's protectiveness and smotheringness was simply just a charming quirk. Percy's first real relationship was with a woman who was in an open marriage, and when Rose learned about this, she actually condoned it. Percy would later end it when his mother thought it was too much of a distraction from his musical work. But Percy's most profound affectation was perhaps his affinity for the whip. He liked whipping and he liked being whipped. Let's just say that he would have really enjoyed Fifty Shades of Grey. He knew that it was abnormal behavior and he knew that it likely stemmed from the fact that he was beaten well into his teen years. He wrote that he had the desire to have kids just to beat them up and that if he ever had had kids, he would have explained to them how much whipping them would have made him feel good inside and tried to convince them for their consent to have him whip them. Fortunately for the rest of humanity, he never had any kids, which, you know, bullet dodge there. He knew on some level that such an action would be wrong on moral and ethical levels, but he still couldn't stop his desires. In an era when running was considered strange for someone who wasn't involved in professional athletics, Percy would often jog into towns. Instead of using trains or wagons, he would simply put all of his gear on his back in a knapsack and jog to the next town. When he realized that the moniker The Jogging Pianist was becoming a thing, he decided to just keep on going with it. He decided that he would enter on the stages and leap over pianos just for dramatic effect. His style of play was known to be very polarizing as he was known to smack the keys in loud passages and smack them just as hard in supposedly soft ones because he felt like the person in the back of the audience should be able to hear just as well as the person in the front row. When critics complained of how brittle his playing was, Granger actually took it as a compliment. He played Bach like nobody's business, but he hated Beethoven and he also loved Brahms. Strange. Despite his fanatical racism, he was actually really interested in the music of other cultures. Jazz was just in its infancy and wasn't yet in a recognizable form, but he absolutely loved ragtime. He loved oriental music and would often go to the Chinatown in Melbourne as a young child just to hear the sounds of these oriental instruments, and he loved his exposure to Javanese gamelan music. He would even rent instruments of the family he called tuneful percussion, such as the xylophone, which really hadn't made it into the orchestra or wind ensemble proper at this time, and he would play around with them just to figure out exactly what they did. He was absolutely enamored with the sound of these tuneful percussion instruments. Of course, at the same time, he was still so racist that he didn't call any of his pieces chamber music. He called them room music. Granger was one of the earliest rhythmic experimenters. While the young Igor Stravinsky was still writing his Symphony in E-flat under the tutelage of Nikolai Rimsky korsakov still a few years away from his breakout constant rhythmic fluctuation of the Rite of Spring, Granger was writing pieces where the time signature was constantly moving around just as well. Although Granger's attempts at this kind of experimentation were a little more theoretical in nature. He was after something he called beatless music. He wanted to imitate nature directly and not just expound upon man's views of nature, which he thought made for inherently inferior music. When Cyril Scott publishes Piano Sonata, which is full of the same technique, although actually playable, Granger thought the only legitimate piano sonata of the entire century. Granger can be given some credit for being the first to use meter in such a way, but he took credit for almost every technique he used, which didn't really make any sense. In fact, saying that he was the first to end pieces on certain chords belied really an ignorance of much of the music of Debussy or Chopin, composers whose works he actually played. In fact, Granger met Debussy once, and wasn't at all put off by the Frenchman's bizarre affectations such as insisting on taking his tea in a different room from all of his visitors. Granger did not like public performances, and in fact he dreaded them. He had suicidal thoughts before and during them. He never got over this immense stage fright, but he thought that if he could just build up enough money from these concert performances, he wouldn't have to do them at some point, and he could focus all of his energies on composition. 
but this never actually managed to pan out. This financial situation never materialized in part because of his extreme generosity towards friends and family. He would send money to members of the Aldridge family and lump sums, and at one point decided that, well, maybe I should make this into something where I put it in a bank and they can get the interest on it. And when he did that, they tried to sue him. His escapades on tour became legendary, running upwards of 60 miles between cities, shoveling coal while naked just to keep fit while aboard cruise ships, and at one point befriending a pack of Zulu warriors while running across South Africa. When he caught up to his entourage in the city, he said, Hey, I'd like to invite these guys in. And his friends said, No, if you do that, not only will you start a new Boer War, but you'll get all of us kicked out of the country. And so he didn't. Granger soon became involved in folk song collection and would spend several years going up and down the English countryside jotting down folk tunes. His views on folk songs and their proper collection would put him at odds with the other people in the nascent field of musicology. But his work was so important that not only are his folk music settings some of his most beloved pieces, but Bella Bartok himself was interested in Granger's work. He was so dedicated to the cause that he would often collect many tunes from places that others considered bereft of any good ones. At one point, he tracked down an old lady who apparently had a great voice and knowledge of many obscure folk songs. When he approached her, she declined to sing them. But Granger was undaunted, and in fact located this lady's granddaughter, who said, yeah, sure, I'll help you out. So she hid him under a bed, invited her grandmother in, and asked her to sing songs for her. And while she did, Granger was still below the bed, just scribbling away at these folk melodies. His folk song arrangements led to the aforementioned interest, although not correspondence with Bala Bartok, and led to a lifelong friendship with Friedrich Dilius, as well as Edvard Grieg. Grieg was in the latter years of his life, and his poor health often put him in sour moods. But Granger's friendship cheered him up, and it helped that Granger could speak with him in his native Norwegian, as Granger decided early on that he would learn all of the Scandinavian languages. Granger became well known for interpreting Grieg's piano concerto. Grieg was taken by Granger's playing and thought him the only person who could give justice to his pieces at the keyboard, more so than any Scandinavian. But Granger still really feared public performance. In fact, at one point he played Schumann's Toccata in C major, a very daunting piece, and halfway through just completely forgot the rest of it. So he just made it up. And this terrified him, and when he opened the papers the next day to see the reviews, he thought they were going to absolutely slam him for this. But it turns out that all the critics thought he had great control over the piece. So despite the fact that no one could tell he faked his way through half of it, he still never played it again. Granger became interested in the idea of elastic scoring, and often tried to compress as much musical information into as few stabs as possible. His idea was that he could increase orchestral or wind band performances by notating proportions between different groups of instruments not necessarily requiring an orchestra or wind band of a certain size. On top of that, some instrumental choirs were rendered completely optional. Granger left the actual practicality of shaping the sound and overall proportion to the conductors of specific ensembles, because he figured that the conductors would know their ensembles the best. Granger thought it his duty just to give the bare bones and outline of the works, and it actually worked, because for wind band, his pieces formed the cornerstone of the repertoire. While on tour, Granger kept his own stash of whips and did his own laundry so as to hide the bloodstains. Amongst Granger's friends, this reality was really an open secret, and no one understood him. Well, not even Granger himself. He was interested in giving a scientific account of himself and who he was, what he felt like, and what his music was like. This influenced the way he collected folk songs, but in his private life, basically meant that he was going to keep track of the when, where, and how, and pretty much every detail of his habitual self-flagellation. He even went so far as to photograph the outcomes, and when he did so, would sometimes write down the camera information. Rose knew of her son's behaviors and fantasies, and often would encourage him to just settle down and get married, but then Percy would scare her off by giving her very deep and dark and very exaggerated accounts of his darkest fantasies some of which were really quite disgusting. At the onset of World War I, Granger and his mother moved to the U.S. and began a series of concert tours. Granger considered himself equal parts coward and conscientious objector and felt like if he was going to become the first Australian composer of any worth, he would have to preserve his own life for posterity. A piece he would refer to as his conscientious objector piece, The Power of Rome and the Christian Heart, 
which is odd considering that he was a Latin-hating atheist, was begun during this period. When the U.S. entered the war, Granger realized that there was no stopping his involvement in the armed services. So he decided that he was going to take charge of where he ended up. So he bought a saxophone and marched to the nearest army outpost and said, I want to join the band. Well, as it turned out, the band director for this particular group was a friend of his. And when he heard Granger play, he said, No, you actually suck on the saxophone. Here's an oboe, learn a little bit of it, and when you're good enough to join the band, I'm going to promote you to Bandsman Second Class. This was a great existence for Granger because he didn't have to see action, and most importantly, he could study the ins and outs of all the instruments of the wind band, which made his later wind band works really good. Unfortunately, he was later spotted by a reporter, and, well, once the Red Cross heard of it, it was over for his peaceful little band life. He was contracted by the Red Cross to go on concert tours, where all the proceeds would go to the Red Cross, and none to him. And he felt like he was just being worked to death with something that he absolutely hated. He never got a penny and was eventually discharged in 1919, after which he had to go on tour again because he was broke. Granger and his mother settled outside White Plains, New York. At that point, it was a little more than an hour and a half outside New York City by train. Rose was by this point very much feeling the effects of secondary syphilis, and her mind, which already wasn't in the greatest shape, began to deteriorate even further. On multiple occasions, she would fake seizures or heart attacks or other convulsions on the floor just to test to see if Percy was still in love with her. Her micromanagement of Percy's relationships eventually culminated in utter disaster because when one of Percy's girlfriends saw how close their relationship was, she publicly accused the two of being in an incestuous relationship, which absolutely horrified the both of them to no end. Percy was mortified and tried to publicly correct the record, but Rose was so mortified and so mentally unstable from the effects of the secondary syphilis that she leapt to her death from the height of a skyscraper. Upon hearing the news, Granger was to keep a locket containing a letter around his neck for the rest of his life. He aged considerably over the next few years and actually had a book made up about Rose Granger. And the last page was a photograph of her dead body. They sent this to friends! They didn't really know quite what to make of it, but they shrugged it off because they, that was Granger and he was just weird like that. While Granger had long since achieved fame as a concert pianist, he still longed for the day when he was known more as a composer than as simply an interpreter. In the vast inflation of post-war Germany, Granger was able to get orchestras to play his pieces for pennies on the dollar. During the Great Depression, he instituted a policy where he would play a concerto for a substantially reduced rate, on the condition that the orchestra would also play something of his. He rewrote almost every piece for every possible instrumental combination imaginable, and he was eager to hear all these different combinations tried out. All the while, he was promoting blue-eyed music, which was his term for a celebration of anything and everything Nordic. His teaching style emphasized the pedals, specifically the sostenuto pedal, the middle pedal, which his scores indicate a fondness of. And he also decided that his students needed to have a ruthless focus and ruthless dedication to whatever piece that they were playing, to the point that he would actually set up two students on two pianos in one room and have them play completely different pieces, just to make sure that students could focus on one thing and completely block out everything else. And as much as he despised the Germans, his go-to teaching material was J.S. Bach's The Well-Tempered Clavier. During this time, he happened to meet Ella Strong, a Nordic girl in a customs line. She became a pupil of his, and they eventually fell head over heels in love. Percy wrote the piece To a Nordic Princess, which was played immediately before their wedding, in the Hollywood Bowl. The audience was split in twain between those who thought it cute and those who thought it incredibly ostentatious. For her part, Ella agreed to it without knowing exactly what the Hollywood Bowl was. Granger spent some time as a music educator, spending time at NYU and the Interlochen Festival, but he ended up despising academicism in music because of his experiences there. He delivered a series of sometimes brilliant, but often delusional and contradictory lectures. Sometimes these would even come in column form. At one point, he wrote that rhythm and melody were two completely different things, and melody was what music should be, and rhythm was just sort of absurd. This was so weird and so out there and so incredibly bizarre that Bella Bartok had to write a rebuttal in the same space just a few weeks later. Nevertheless, Granger's time in the lecture hall led to some important connections, and in fact, he can be credited for introducing Duke Ellington to the music of Frederick Delius. Delius died in the interwar years, which left a profound impact on Granger, who, along with several other friends of Delius, at one point had lifted the composer, who had become nearly blind and almost completely paralyzed from his own syphilis, to the top of a mountain so he could see a sunset for the last time. 
In the years preceding the Second World War, Granger had the idea of founding his own museum in Melbourne, and he funded this by going around Australia and playing concerts. And when he was not doing this, he would help with the bricklaying. He and Ella began collecting important documents and instruments in fireproof rooms in the basement of the house at White Plains. Granger's enemies thought he was being really pretentious for starting a museum dedicated to himself, but Granger thought it was not just for himself, but for his own ideas, which he thought would later be justified by the advances of science. Granger conceived of free music, which he claimed he had heard throughout his life. Music that was free from what he considered absurd goose-stepping, which was harmony and form and rhythm and all sorts of things. He wanted to make music just melody, and to that end he decided he would make all sorts of strange synthesizers from old scraps of musical instruments as well as junk that he and Ella would find behind buildings. He was inspired by Arnold Schoenberg and the earliest microtonal experimenters, and the construction of these machines would end up taking most of the rest of his life. His earliest attempts at free music were written for string quartet, which was later changed to four theremins, the theremin being one of the earliest electronic instruments. When he was dissatisfied with that, he decided to create his own fantastical machines, which ended up looking something out of Willy Wonka. But around this time, he felt a pain in his abdomen, which ended up being cancer. And instead of pursuing treatments, which were very few and far between in the 1950s, he decided to take the advice of his old friend Cyril Scott, who, to be perfectly honest, was taken with pseudoscientific quackery. He recommended a bloodletting expert up in upstate New York, and Granger followed Scott's advice out of loyalty to his old friend, which might have cost him a few years. Scott also, interestingly enough, uh, said that he had made contact with Rose on a spiritual plane soon after her death. The Grangers feared invasion of America, and the outbreak of hostilities of World War II, they moved to Springfield, Missouri. He resumed his role as a wartime concert giver and promoter of the Red Cross, but he was also able to hear some of his own works for wind band being played for the first time. In fact, he was quite taken with the performances of some of his toughest pieces for wind band played without a hitch by the band at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Yet at the same time, he became more pessimistic, lamenting the fact that no one had followed him on his experiments, and he considered himself a leader without followers. He regretted that no one else had taken up his cause as promoter of Nordic musical superiority. He thought of his musical career as essentially a failure because he never achieved fame in composition as he had at the piano. As his free music experimentation continued, he began excoriating the commonplace nature of his former works in letters to his friends. His free music machines are actually the precursors of not just the first electronic synthesizers that were coming out around the time of his death, but I actually have some things in common with some of today's microtonal keyboards. Granger was a man of extreme views. He was capable of lauding Duke Ellington as one of the greatest composers who ever lived, while at the same time taking pictures of the eyes of blonde-haired and blue-eyed composers so he could put them in his museum to demonstrate their inherent superiority. Granger himself saw his personality as an enigma which he did not wish to solve, and this makes him one of the most fascinating characters in all of music history.